this isn't this isn't working, is it? I can't have you yapping through my recording. You're gonna be so much trouble. You might as well star in the video, huh? <laughs> Hello, everyone. A little bit different today. We're going to do an art Q and A. So I've asked you on social media to ask me questions about what you would like to know about art and museums and anything to do with any of those things. And you came up with some awesome questions. So let's get right to it. By the way, if you're new here, my name is Nancy Langham Hooper. I'm a PhD art historian and cultural enthusiast ready to use the great art of the world to help you out, or in this case, to answer your questions about it. If you like my channel, please subscribe and do the ding and do the click and all the things, uh, cause that really helps. Let's get on with the questions. Okay, so I think I'm gonna start with the most kind of general questions and then move on to the specific. So the first question is, who decides what is art? And that is actually, that's a huge question that you, you can write books on that question. Uh, but what was interesting to me is that um, the person who wrote this question, somebody responded to her. And I just wanna show you what their response is because I think it's really telling about how we feel about art as a society. This person said, Remy, Remy's chewing paper. said, you do. If you like it, it is art. If you do not, it is crap. But one would not say one does not like Monet or Michelangelo or that bloke who painted your GGF in that famous triptych. You know that one. I, I don't know that one. I don't know what you're talking about. So I think it helps us if we move this question over and just replace the word art with music. Who decides what is music? Well, there we have some context. Anybody can make music and anybody can say something is music. I mean, I can like throw a rock at a wall and say it's music. I can throw a rock at a wall and say it's art, but that doesn't mean anybody's gonna give me a record contract. You know what I mean? That uh, commenter said, if you, you wouldn't say that you don't like Monet or Michelangelo, and those are very famous artists, but you can absolutely not like them. You cannot like any artist you want. It doesn't matter how famous or how much everybody thinks this person is amazing, how much I think this person is amazing. You're allowed to hate who you wanna hate as far as art goes. You can say whatever you want because there are no art police and there are no music police. I once had a debate with my friend Stefan on the underground all the way from Heathrow Airport to Piccadilly Circus about what is art. And we came up with two differing notions. He said it is any intentional act. And that can be that can be anything. That making your breakfast, sure. My definition tended to be it was any intentionally creative act. Creating something new, where you're trying to birth an idea. Something new is coming out of it. Nothing new is coming out of my breakfast. Anyway, that's my personal definition of art, but you know, it is quite wide ranging. All right, next question. Somebody has asked, who is your favorite artist and or piece of art and why? Again, if we switch this to the music metaphor, this is like asking a music lover to say who's their favorite band. I just, it's impossible. It's impossible. I just love everything. I mean, that's kind of why I do what I do. And I love all different time periods and I love any art that just speaks to me, um, which is a lot of it, which is most of it really, if you give it a chance. What I will say though is I am the world's expert on John Rogers Herbert RA, who I did my PhD thesis on and I am halfway through, always halfway through, writing a book on his life and work. So I do have a little soft spot for him. Yeah, so I think that would be my favorite. Okay, the next question. Why do museums still insist on keeping questionably acquired pieces of art that were stolen from families during World War II? This is also, this is a great question and a hugely complicated one, it turns out. There has been a huge effort to return art that was looted by the Nazis to the original families or descendants of those uh, mostly Jewish families from whom they were stolen. There are several databases now. Uh, one, the most famous one is the Lost Art Register. And I'll link a few of them down below that help reunite those paintings with the original owners or the their descendants. The problem comes when we don't know exactly the provenance 
of certain paintings. Provenance is a word that art historians and museums use a lot. It means the history of that particular painting, who owned it. So for instance, uh, it started with the artist and then went to this person, this person, this person, this person. And in a lot of old art, as you would imagine, there are huge gaps in the provenance. Like it disappears for a hundred years and then it turns up over here. And one of the problems with returning artwork to uh, the original owners is that the provenance is just sketchy. We don't know, is this the painting that that family lost or is it a copy or is it a different one or is it one by the same artist but not the same one? And one of the reasons that the Lost Art Database and other resources are now being offered to museums is so that they can spend more of their resources researching the provenance of their paintings. And when in that World War II period, there's like a sketchy hole, then they that's a red flag that that might be a work of stolen art. There is a huge push now to give museums the resources to research those provenances. There's also government help that's happening. There's an EU resolution that recently passed about you know giving the resources and, and kind of pushing the museums to do the work to do it. Another reason museums may be hesitant to give back paintings is because they have very strict deacquisition policies. So that means that the museum has basically a binding pact, almost you know, kind of a law in its governance that says it cannot sell any of its works. And this is to protect the museum's collections from like say a rogue person gaining directorship of the museum and deciding just to sell off everything and then buy new everything. They're there for a reason, but that also can be a, a big legal hurdle in the way of returning works of art that are stolen. If they've been in the museum collection for a while, say since the war or something, um, the deacquisition policy may come into effect. So that's been difficult as well. I don't think anybody is sitting there going, we know this belongs to this particular family, but we have it. Ha 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 ha. I don't think it's like that. I think it's more like most injustices. It's, it's more bureaucracy. Okay, the next question is, are you ever allowed to touch art? Generally, no. As we know, right, from museums, you know that you're generally not allowed to touch the art. And here is the reason why. You have oils in your fingers and even, you know, moisture in your breath. If it was just you seeing that work of art, then it might not be such a big deal. But when it's hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, over time, it doesn't take long for uh, touch to destroy works of art. Even sculptures, which you would think, you know, paintings we go, okay, well fine, you know, that might hurt it if we touch it. But even sculptures uh, over time will show the wear and tear of touch. That's generally the reason that museums say uh, no, no touching of the artwork. I should also include in that, don't ever use flash photography on artwork either, especially paintings and especially textiles. That is another thing that just, that is really bad for the surface paint, for the fabric. Um, just, just don't do that. However, however, there are certain art objects that are made for you to touch them. A uh, kind of a, a textural textile, <laughs> textile, they're a sensual experience. What am, I, what am I trying to say? So yes, there are certain pieces of art that you are welcome to touch and that touch is part of the experience of the art and that will be clearly labeled. That will be clearly labeled and you'll be able to see, yes, it's okay to touch this. There's another kind of art that you can touch as well. They've been creating some 3D kind of landscapes of various works of art, sculptures or paintings for people who are visually impaired. They can run their hands, run their eyes, if you like, over the, the landscape of the painting and get a general feel for where the figures are and what's happening and the movement in the painting and things. So that's really exciting too. And I think we should need to bring more of these into uh, places where uh, visual impaired people can access them because it's only fair, right? We need to make art open to everybody. Okay, here's a tricky one. What artwork is the best representation of happiness or evokes happiness? Wow, happiness is so personal to the viewer. 
something that may evoke happiness in me doesn't necessarily evoke happiness in someone else. When I was a teenager, I loved Renoir's Moulin de la Galette. It just made me so happy. It made me feel like I was at that party. And other people look at it and go, meh. So I would say it is very personal. However, there is a type of art that was practiced. It began in the 1950s all the way up to the, say, 70s, 80s were the heyday of it, uh, called color field painting. And in this kind of abstract expressionist painting, artists would use big blocks of just color, no form, no shape, no any kind of realistic representation. It was just a field of color. And the reason they did that is because they were learning about ideas of, of how our brain interprets certain colors. And basically they wanted to evoke emotion in the viewer through color alone. And some of the paintings are incredibly powerful for how simple they are. Uh, Rothko is an excellent example of someone of this school. And the emotion of happiness in the color field theory is kind of orange. This beautiful couple of paintings from Rothko, you can see are created in these bright, happy colors. And at that time, the idea is to give you an emotional experience and choosing those colors, the emotional experience would be happiness. Does it work for you? See my first point. It may, it may not, but there is a painting that is designed to invoke your happiness. So the last question today comes from my Facebook post where I asked you if you had any questions. And I put an image on that post of a painting by Rene Magritte. And I got the question, who is Magritte? And what does it say under the pipe? In the interest of being thorough, I would answer that as well. So Rene Magritte, famous surrealist painter in the early 20th century, known for his kind of playing with reality. So you can see he has a very realistic style here and he has painted in careful detail a smoking pipe, a tobacco pipe. And in the text below, it says, this here is not a pipe. And he's right, it's not a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. So Magritte was playing with what we think is real. So for instance, the idea that we look in the mirror and we say, that's me. Well, it's not you, it's your reflection. It's a you know light bouncing off of you. It's not you in that mirror. That's one of the things that Surrealist played with, with this idea of our language and how we can seem to be literal, but we're actually not literal. So this is not a pipe. So there you go, your art questions answered. I hope uh, that's clarified some things for you and given you some interesting things to think about. Thank you to everyone who asked me questions. Marry me. It's inappropriate. Don't do that on YouTube. No. What was I saying? Thank you to everyone who sent in your questions. If you have more questions for me, please do pop them in the comments below. I'd love to continue to answer any questions you have about art, artists, museums, the art world, no matter how strange, outrageous, or heretical they are. All right, guys, I'll see you next week. Take care, and remember, you got this. Uh -huh.